this is really cool. I get to do a lot of really cool things in my life and my job. Uh, this is one of those things like where, uh, since I use your products daily, um, like almost minute by minute in my life, like being here, uh, one, I'm really nervous about what you guys know about me. Um, uh, you know, but two, like this is this is this is a real privilege. So uh, so thanks for thanks for having me. Our pleasure, John. Thanks so much for coming. Um, let's go ahead and dive right in. Yeah. Um, you, know, you open up the book talking about your history of discovering beer. Um, I believe your father drank Heineken. He did. He and, does. Uh, what did the other members of your family drink? They were a lot of Bud drinkers, a lot of Bud Light drinkers. Um, I think just given the time, and I think this is relatable to a lot of folks as well. Um, you know, our, our parents, our grandparents, whatever, drank whatever was available to them at the time or whatever they perceived their brand to be. So they were families that were Schaefer families or Bud Light families or Bush families or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, my dad, for whatever reason, uh, and I still haven't talked to him about this even though it's in the book, um, uh, he would get Heineken in the house and he just kind of liked it. He liked the, the weird skunky taste, I guess. And uh, when I would sne sneak tastes, you know, and I was 12 or 13 or 14, whatever, uh, you know, yeah, about that. Um, you know, it's terrible, like why would you want to do this? And I drink it today, I'm like, this is terrible. Why would you want to do that? Um, but it's also, you know, it's a it's a really fine beer and it's a it's a well made beer. Um, but yeah, so I, I think you know, drinking so much of, of what our experiences are, depending on your age, uh, comes from those who you know we we were uh, watching. You know, we were watching their habits. I learned it from watching you. Um, and, and we're we're at this point though where with with so many breweries in the country that you know, like my daughter who's 20 months old right now. By the time you know she hits 18 in, in the UK and 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 uh, 21 here, um, she'll she'll know a word uh, that has endless beer possibilities. So I have no idea what'll be in my fridge at that point or what she'll gravitate towards. But um, yeah, so much of it is just timing. Yeah. My, uh, my grandfather drank Schlitz. He was my introduction to beer. And yeah. I was young, probably starting at age seven or eight, when I would go to his house, he had bought these little like eight ounce barrel shaped beers. Mm -hmm. And he would give me one of those. So I've been a, uh, a beer lover since, you know, walking time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also enjoyed your story about, um, you know, I think you described it as choking down your first IPA yeah. at, the, at the local brew pub. What uh, what do you think about that today? And thinking back, you know, so it's it's twofold, and I don't I don't want to disparage too much. Um, I, I still go back to that brewery uh, where I drank my first IPA, and um, uh, on draft, as, as it were, on my twenty first birthday, I walked into this local brew pub, and uh, I forced myself to to drink a a, a, a beer because um, I wanted to drink better beer. I wanted to be accustomed to, to to something that was not what everybody was drinking at the at the frat parties or you know the college parties. Uh, and the bartender served me this IPA and like laughed at me as I was like, oh, that's terrible. You know, it sounded like Cleo uh, in the, in the, in the beginning. Um, but. The cool thing is that the bartender actually explained hops to me. And when we think about IPAs, and it's the most popular craft beer style right now, uh, it, it, it's bitter for the most part. It's hop forward, and hops are part of the cannabis family. You can't do with hops what you do with cannabis. Like, don't don't try. Um, I don't know what the policy is here, but like, just just don't. Like, hops are good for making beer and making beer only. Um, but in those early days, and even still, like it's 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 a bittering agent in a lot of ways. And when you say bitter to people, like oh, I don't I don't want to try bitter. Um, but this bartender started talking to me about pine and grapefruit and citrus and some of these other flavors that are and aromas that are derived from hops. And I think once you can flip your brain to that and start thinking about it those ways, as opposed to just the bitter sensation, but actually what it is that we're tasting and experiencing, it, it brings you around in a whole new way. So uh, I'm really grateful that. I I ordered a second pint that day, uh, and that it inadvertently set me off to where I am right now, which is again in this, you know, cool room. I used to travel quite a bit to England in in my 20s, so long time ago, and I remember what a revelation it was to go to a pub there and have you know a, a cask ale, a pulled English bitter. Mm -hmm. And uh, these days, the term bitter is kind of a misnomer compared to what we drink today with West Coast IPAs. But it was my introduction to the, I think you described as non-beer tasting beer. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, it's beer flavored beer is one of these things where, uh, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, but 
we lost our food traditions in a lot of ways in the same time that we lost our beer traditions. And so we used to know where all of our food came from and we used to know, uh, you know where our beer, our beer came from. Like before Prohibition, there's something like 4,300 breweries operating in the country, which is crazy when you think about it. Um, and, and back in those times, like if you were drinking local beer in your, wherever city you were in, uh, you knew where it came from and you knew where your meat came from and your vegetables and your bread and your cheese, even if you made it at home kind of thing. And then we lost our way with like, you know, uh, velvet Vita became, you know, instead of real cheese and fresh baked bread was Wonder Bread and a plastic tray in the microwave for five minutes, we called it dinner. And, and before Prohibition, like the beers were stouts and saisons and ales of all different kinds and spruce tip, whatever. Um, and then by the time we got out of it, it was all beer flavored beer in the same way. And so um, we've sort of come back a little bit I, in, in, in a great way where you can eat local, you can drink local in ways like you haven't before. Yeah, interesting. Um, beer, of course, has an ancient history, and there's even some scholarship now that suggests that beer is the actual root of civilization as opposed to bread, which we normally hear. I can't think of anything better than I like the laughter that's happening. Like people are like, "Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is my ancestors. That's cool." Yeah. And then, of course, for uh, for years, drinking beer um, was safer than drinking water. Oh yeah. So uh, maybe give a little history of, on, uh, on that, and, and also the role beer played in the founding of the United States. Yeah. So. Um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the nomadic tribes early on would find sweet grass that they would then steep in warm water and it would become beer uh, or even not steep in warm water, it would just like, you know, naturally ferment. You know, they put grass in water and the sugars uh, would naturally ferment from, uh, from, from the yeast in the air uh, and that they would happily get drunk off of it. And uh, when they found places that they're like, oh, we like this, like, let's stay here uh, because it's good to us. And the goddess Ninkasi, uh, who is the, the goddess of beer, uh, is good to us in this place. And so places, uh, people would stay there. Um, but when you look back, especially to the United States, this is a country that was founded on beer. Captain Bradford's diaries from the Mayflower said our vittles were running low, especially our beer. And so beer was potable water on the ships. And the original plan was to go down to Virginia, but they stopped off in Massachusetts instead and got down to the business of brewing because the beer on board, this 3.2 near beer, porter, whatever, that was their, their, their food, their sustenance, um, they were almost out of. And then from that point on, and I talk about this in the book a little bit more of, um, you know, during the revolution, you know, the founding fathers were drinking ales, were drinking uh, ciders. We hear a lot about how George Washington Washington and Thomas Jefferson were home brewers. Um, a lot of that's nonsense. Um, you know, like they weren't like sitting around the garage with their sleeves rolled up and fife music playing in the background as they're mashing in like their homebrew recipes. No, it was done by the women of the household or the slaves of the house um, at, at the time. Um, but it played a role, you know, in it. And then certainly we became a country of immigrants. And if you were, you know, a barber or a baker or a tailor in the old world, you'd come over and you'd apply that here. And we were really lucky to have a lot of brewers who came over as well and set up. And so, yeah, we've had a really long complicated relationship with beer uh, in this country for a really long time. Uh, and it continues to today. Very interesting. So beer is made traditionally with four ingredients. Yeah. Malted barley, hops, water, and yeast. And yeah. yeast was only discovered a little later, kind of happened by accident for a right. long time. Right, we thought it was magic. We thought yeah. it was a gift from the gods. People would use the magic stick and they would, it would, it would you know, stirring the, stirring the juice and it would turn into beer. Yeah. Um, and the word malt's kind of funny. I mean, the only other place we hear the word malt is with malted milk balls or, or, or malted milk. Yeah. Um, what is malt, and, and how do those ingredients come together to make beer? Uh, well, I, malt is just a, it's a grain, you know? And so you can use all different kinds of grain. You can use rye or sorghum or rice or corn, um, and a lot of brewers do uh, in their beer as well. Um, so it, it is basically a means to get sugar uh, into water. You boil the grain, you get it into to water, um, uh, and then uh, the yeast is added, the hops are, the hops are added to, for flavor and for bittering, uh, and then yeast comes into the play afterwards uh, and eats the sugars and creates alcohol and carbonation. Uh, as, as it were. But I think arguably the most important ingredient to talk about is water. And without it, we wouldn't have beer. Without it, we wouldn't have life. Without it, we wouldn't have our, our general existence, as it were. And it's fascinating to me that 
you know, home brewers and, and beer drinkers, they love talking about hops first and foremost. Uh, it's, you know, the, 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 the flavors, the aromas, the bitterness, the, you know, it's, it's a very it's sexually exciting ingredient. Um, you know, water is just, we sort of take it for granted. We turn the tap and, and, and there it is. But when you think about how much of the world like doesn't have access to fresh water um, or what you see happening in Flint, Michigan and in some other cities as well, like we as beer fans and beer drinkers, and especially as the brewers themselves need to be thinking about where their water is coming from and how to uh, protect the resource, you know, to, to fight back against people who are uh, trying to damage our water sources. And, um, you know, that to me, I think is the most important thing that doesn't, you know, doesn't get talked about. Um, but now that I just bummed out the room, I think we should probably have a beer. Yeah, so uh, I, I agree. It's fun to talk about beer, but it's a lot more fun to drink. Yeah. So um, what are we going to try here first? So this is Allagash Saison. I'm just going to do a... Thank you. I'll reach over for you there. Perfect. And talk about tasting beer too. How, sh how should we um, approach this as we as we taste our first beer today? All right. So right off the bat, and I'm not faulting you guys, but this is actually really kind of cool. So on this glass, you're going to see carbonation sticking to the inside, and Cleo's going to lose her mind a little bit. But uh, uh, you see the carbonation sticking to the inside walls of the glass. Uh, that's probably because this is a fresh glass and it hasn't been you know fully uh, fully rinsed out yet. But if you like walk into a place like a bar and you see carbonation sticking to the inside. That typically means that there's some dust behind, or some soap residue, uh, or you know something that makes it a non-beer clean glass. Again, we're all fine here today, and I'm like, I'm actually really glad that that happened because it's a pet peeve of mine when I'm out at a at a bar, especially a place that like considers themselves to be a beer bar. Um, but in the same way that you'd return a dirty fork if you got it at a restaurant, um, it's just one of those things to to be mindful of. So, I'm, so I want to yeah. assure you first of all that we hand washed oh, yeah. glasses and rinsed them because. <laughs> We knew this could come up, so. Um, it's in the book, like it's, it's one of my things in the book. Um, all right, so a couple of quick ways to, to, to taste beer. First, also, uh, when you're doing Instagram or Twitter or whatever you guys are, are doing these days, Google Plus, um, labels out, always, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Um, it was mean. That was so mean of me. Uh, so always labels out first so that people can, can, can see what you're doing. Um, appearance is really important. Think about what the color makes you think of. Uh, is it, you know, the color of autumn leaves? Is it black as night? Is it uh, the color of a sunset or, you know, whatever? Um, think about what the color of the beer makes you think of in your mind. Um, next thing is aroma, and you kind of get it going to about 45 RPM. <laughs> Older folks in the room are like, cool. The hipsters <laughs> are like, yeah. And everybody else is like, uh huh. Um, so you do that. And then most people will go like this to smell the beer. Don't do that. Like, don't. Uh, not only are you going to get the tip of your nose wet, um, uh, and you don't want that, but it, it's not going to help you. So uh, the, the thing that I kind of like to do is like a typewriter or like a drive-by where you just start to inhale. And you run the glass under your nose. So you're getting the ambient air, and then you're getting the beer, and then you're getting the ambient air again. And start to think about flavors. Uh, we can talk about more about that, I guess. But like, you know, think about the, the, the flavors that are coming through, the aromas that are coming through. You know, does it smell spicy? Does it smell like lemons? Does it smell like whatever? Um, then the next thing is obviously taste. And that's the fun part, um, certainly. But so much of what we perceive as taste comes from aroma. Uh, and so. Think about what you just smelled, if it was a lemon or cake or, or you know, whatever is spice um, that, that comes through. And now, is it, is it much more acute uh, now that you've tasted the beer? And it probably should be. And then the next thing to take into consideration is mouthfeel. Uh, and so you take a sip and you hold it on your tongue for about three seconds or so. And feel the carbonation. Is it like scrubbing bubbles or is it li a little bit more flat? Uh, does the liquid feel thick? Does it feel watery? You know, a lot of people will say to me, oh, I don't like Guinness. It's much too heavy. Uh, and they're just judging the beer by its color. But if you ever take a sip of Guinness, it's very watery on the tongue. Uh, there's almost no body to that particular beer. Um, but some of the IPAs that we're going to have in a minute that are lighter in color uh, are going to coat your tongue in sort of this oily, slick kind of way. And so... Um, and then the last thing to consider while you're, while you're tasting a beer is really, um, uh, do you like it? 
And if so, great, like have some more. And if not, uh, if you're like Cleopatra, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, you're just gonna be like the running foil for this entire talk now. Um, that's cool because there's 7,000 breweries in the country right now and they're all making a multitude of styles and you'll find something that you like. Um, like this Saison from Allagash, which has been making great beer in Maine for 25 years now and is one of the top brewers in the world and they do Belgian inspired beers and this is a Belgian inspired beer and this is one of the best examples uh, in the US that's being made today. So that's why we got it. Very nice, tasty. Everyone like that one? Who liked that one? Who didn't like that one besides Cleo? All right, but, all right, but really quick, what, what don't you care about? There's a guy in a blue shirt back there. What, what didn't you care about it? I, I just don't like the flavor. I don't know how else to, to put it. I mean, I like the mouthfeel, but I don't, I don't care for the flavor. So the clove cinnamon flavor isn't your thing. And that's cool, right? I mean, and that's, and that's the thing. Like, I, I, this isn't an attack by any means. Like, so often in beer geek culture today, though, people will try to convince you why you're wrong. Um, and I don't think that that's a fair thing. And I think that the smart brewers know that diversity is king. And so you can walk into Allagash and you can get stouts. Um, you know, they make, you know, their table beers. They make a whole bunch of other stuff as well because they know that, you know, not one style of beer is going to appeal to everybody. And there's some brewers that just make one style of beer. And I think they're alienating themselves a little bit, you know, too much. So like, um, yeah, I think if you give every beer a fair shake, uh, and that's what I, I like to talk about in the book a little bit, but give every beer a fair shake, but also, you know, in the same way that if you don't like Brussels sprouts or you don't like goat cheese or you don't like, you know, anything else that we experience in life, like nobody gives you a hard time for that either. So the, the beer fans that try to give you a hard time for not liking a beer, um, I, 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 I don't think they're doing it right. Go with what you like. Yeah. Absolutely. So... You know, this is one style of beer. The, the, we have these four ingredients, malt, hops, water, and yeast. Yeah. How, does that, how do you make different styles of beer? What, uh, what goes into that? So, so much of it is how much you use of each. Um, and then, again, there's different um, flavor components to each of the main ingredients. And so I like to, you know, I, I, I think I might have talked about this the last time I was here, but it's um, if you look at the four main ingredients and you think about them in food terms, so water doesn't always just taste like water. It can have a salinity to it or a little bit of an iron content to it. Um, or, you know, it can be hard water or soft water. But if you travel around enough or you, you grew up in a place where you got your water from a well versus now you're getting it from a city aquifer, you notice the different tastes in that. And malt, depending on how it's kilned or roasted, um, can have every flavor from Cheerios to grape nuts to chocolate and coffee and toffee to even like burnt acrid, right? You go to a good wood-fired coal pizza place and the pie comes out and on the crust you have that, that little burnt bubble uh, on the end and everybody reaches for it instinctively, right? And we know what it's gonna taste like. It's carbon, <laughs> like it, it's burnt, right? But we, but we do it anyway and we taste it and it's bitter on our tongue. Malt can taste like that as well. Uh, there's people, again, I use Guinness as a great example because it's a beer that everybody's had and everybody knows. People swear that there's coffee and chocolate in it. There's absolutely not. Uh, those are two expensive ingredients. Um, they're using malt that has been roasted to, to taste like that. And then hops can taste like everything from uh, uh, grapefruit and pine to pineapple and peach and strawberry. And there's blueberry ones out there. And there's uh, you know, tangerine and lime and lemon and mango and everything else in between. Uh, and then yeast can have banana and bubble gum and clove and pepper and flowers and honey and everything else. So it, it all just depends on the strains and how much you're using and what combination you're using in them. And then you can, like, the, the, it's game on when it comes to brewers these days where they're just putting, like, anything goes in their beers these days. If you can eat it, Brewers have made a beer with it, um, and everything is on the table. Literally, everything is on the table, uh, from money to sheep shit to <laughs> you know. I, sorry, I don't know if I can uh, say that here. Um, uh, I hope you guys are cool. Um, to all kinds of exotic fruits. I had a beer that was once grilled, uh, uh, brewed with grilled beef hearts. Uh, there is a beer that Dogfish Head did that was brewed with moon dust. 
Um, like it's everything is on the table, uh, and it's all ridiculous, but it can also taste really good. Sorry, this guy's got. I saw yeah. a hand up. Can we yeah. uh, do that? See, this is the fun part about beer tastings, right? It's always like, let's do it at the end, and everybody's like, yeah, I had a couple of beers, I got things to say. So I I had a question just about the saison. Yeah. Uh, what oh, man. gives it more of the characteristic flavor? Is it the hops or the yeast or the malt? More of the yeast mm -hmm. uh, than anything else. It's sort of a, a saison yeast um, uh, in the Belgian tradition. Uh, but also the grain bill helps a lot. The, you know, the hops are very, uh, not all that, I'm not even speaking intelligently anymore. <laughs> um, the chair. Uh, no, it, I know, I'm going to fall asleep in this comfortable chair. Um, yeah, the hops play a minimal, minimal role in this. So it's usually just the yeast strain and, and sort of some of the, the malts that go into it. Mm. So perfect transition. Hops kind of get all the um, all the attention in the in the beer world so today. So much attention. Yeah, yeah. but uh, like as you're talking about now, malts and yeasts really make up the the, the dominant flavors. So uh, well, I don't know about that. I, I I think hops in IPAs are the dominant flavor, and that's the idea. And these days with hazy, juicy IPAs, where it's DDH, it's double dry hopped, and brewers are putting. 20, 30 pounds of hops into a barrel of beer, uh, which is a ridiculous waste of ingredients, uh, in my opinion, but like, but they're doing this anyway. Um, no, hops are definitely, in IPAs, the dominant flavor. Um, but yeast is the most important. Malt gives us the alcohol, uh, and then water is important. But sex are, uh, you know, hops are, are, are sexy. You know, I mean, like, look at this picture that's up here right now. Like, that is, like, that's a really cool looking piece of vegetation, you know, that's growing. And when you walk the hop fields and you just see binds and binds and binds of this as you go, and it's vibrant. And, you know, it, it's one of these things like where, uh, uh, you know, the, the hop rubbings, when you go to the farms or you go to a brewery and you tear them open and there's this sticky powder on the inside of uh, lupulin, um, it's an interactive ingredient as well. You know, malt, like we sing about it as kids when we're singing amber waves of grain um, uh, in, uh, in the national anthem, not the national anthem, in uh, uh, my country, to, yeah, America the Beautiful, thank you. Just, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I wish I could blame it on the jet lag, uh, but I really can't. Um, but yeah, you know, so, so malt has always been a part of our, uh, collective experience, but it's not sexy. It's not like marketable in a lot of ways. You know, malt goes into our cow feed and our dog food and our, you know, our, our Cheerios in the morning kind of thing. Um, and it looks nice when it's waving in the, in the, in the breeze and everything, but uh, hops are you really unique to beer. And so I think that that's one of the other reasons that it's, it's become as, I don't know, the, you know, the, the, the front and center, the mascot right. of, of beer than anything else. So once we're done here, over on the bar, I brought in some various kinds of malts that you can try. You can actually pick up some of that and chew it. Taste each one as its own flavor and two kinds of hops as well. Don't, don't eat those. Don't, don't. Just, just smell those. <laughs> I got really nervous that you're going to, like, where are the interns? It's like, <laughs> interns can go and, yeah, that's... Uh, that's what we used to do at my old magazine. Of, uh, and then um, yeast, I didn't bring any amazing. yeast in, but if you ever get a chance, go down to White Labs down in San Diego. They do something really interesting. They take one wort, which is the sugar water you start with before you ferment it into beer, and they pitch four different yeasts. They split it into four different fermenters and pitch four different yeasts. So then you, you taste the same beer, and the only change in the beer is from the yeast. And it is fascinating, mind-blowing if you're a beer geek. Um, you go from nice traditional ales to these, to these cinnamony clove Belgians with, uh, with just a change in the yeast. Yeah, it's really cool. So Yeast is all around us right now, by the way, though. Uh, if it got cold enough and you guys brewed a beer uh, in, in your parking lot or something and you wheeled it outside into your parking lot um, in the cold enough weather, uh, there's natural yeast that would inoculate. And we see some brewers doing this today. They're doing some wild, some yeah. wild yeast, yeah. definitely. Yeah, it's like how our nomadic ancestors did it. So at that, I think it's time for beer number two. Perfect. What Love are we going to be drinking here? I just came from here. Like, literally, this is why I was late getting here, because I was drinking with uh, Alex Noel, the, the uh, brewmaster there, uh, who's a wonderful individual. If you have a chance to go down and visit their brewery, it's like 20 minutes from here. Uh, and this is their day job pale ale. Uh, and yeah, they're just over in Inglewood. It really is a great spot to, to, uh, to stop by. You can bring food in, and they're uh, good folks over there. Yeah. All right, so the thing that I like about this beer is I'm not against the modern age 
hazy, juicy IPAs that exist. I'm not. Um, I think that they're cool in a lot of ways, and I love that it's pushing the idea of beer forward uh, in, in America and what beer can be. But I really like looking at this beer. Like, this is a fun beer to look at, and a lot of the hazy juicies that are out there these days, uh, where they're thick like milkshakes, uh, you know, they're dense as all get out, like they're pulpy, juicy, orange juicy things. Garrett Oliver of the uh, Brooklyn Brewery uh, said not too long ago that the hazy New England style IPAs uh, were the first beer built for the Instagram age. <laughs> and it's true, you know, like I, my, my Instagram is populated with, uh, you know, just endless, endless, uh, you know, people taking pictures of hazy, juicy, light consuming, Black Star-esque uh, IPAs. Um, um, but I, there's just something about like looking at you know an almost clear glass of beer with a really nice fluffy white head um, and a nice logo and yeah logos out always Thank you, Cleo. Uh, by by all means um, uh, yeah the New York office is going to be really uh, jealous of these by the way uh, they always are uh, <laughs> wow cheers wow all right <laughs> it's the guy from Jersey I'm suddenly feeling outnumbered. Uh, <laughs> But then, you know, it's got this really nice tangerine note to it, um, a little bit of pine on the background. Uh, it's using uh, some old school hops, uh, a little bit of new school flavor to it as well. Um, and, and this just bridges the gap. This is one of those beers that for me, you know, like this is my day job, by the way, like like hanging out and drinking. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is the beer that I would want to, to just sort of while away the afternoon. Um, as a complete aside, uh, and I, I don't know if I get into this in the book or not, but um, I'm a huge advocate for day drinking now and again. Um, Cheers. Yeah, like, but seriously, like, like, just take a day off and just go sit in a bar with a book. Um, not necessarily this one, but just, uh, and this is the type of beer where, I mean, it's a lower ABV, right? It's only in the 5% range, I think. Uh, yeah, five, six. So you can have a couple of these and it's not gonna put you under. Um, but just the, the lost art, of having a beer during the middle of the day, I think is so important, or a drink during the middle of the day, with like, and feeling like a little indulgent about it. I think we've lost our way a little bit with like, even technology and some of these things of always being connected. It's just nice to go sit in a bar, and this is the type of beer that would lend itself perfectly to it. It really is one of my favorite things to do, sit at a bar, talk to people. Yeah. It really is a way to unplug from uh, all of our yeah. Constant notifications and stuff. Or just sit today. with your own thoughts. You know, it's um, uh, on the podcast that I do, Steal This Beer, uh, we're served beers blind. Uh, so in black glasses, the guest brings on, uh, it's this podcast that we do, and the guest brings on the, the, the beers. We don't know what they are. My co-host, Augie Carton from Carton Brewing and I, uh, we don't know what they are. They're served to us in black glasses. And we talk about what the beer is, not necessarily what we want it to be. Uh, but then we also write a sentence of where we would like to enjoy that beer. And that's sort of a fun exercise as well. And this is, again, the name place to it. But this is a beer that I would just go um, you know, sit at the Venice Tap House. Is that still open? Yep, Venice Tap House. Yeah, yeah, the last time I was here, I got into a lot of trouble there. Um, <laughs> uh, I almost missed a flight uh, on, uh, on my way home uh, from there. So or it was. Any of the guys who were there, are you guys here? Yeah, that was fun. That was so much fun. I almost missed my flight. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty wild. But yeah, yeah, well, we'll try to repeat it. But yeah, uh, but think about those types of things, like where you would want to have a beer, like try to place it situationally. I don't know, I feel like I'm off the rails at this point. No, it's all good. So you mentioned earlier prohibition and the, the changes that brought to, uh, to beer drinking and any alcoholic beverage drinking. Um, after the 21st Amendment, things started to recover, but things like farmers, and you know, there was just all kinds of things that were affected in the supply chain. What's different about drinking beer then versus drinking beer today with these, uh, you know, now we're back up with more breweries finally from pre-prohibition. Yeah, uh, it's easier to drink better beer than ever before. And that's the thing. Uh, it's also easier to drink bad beer than ever before. <laughs> Uh, and it's true, just because you can open a brewery doesn't mean that you're gonna make great beer. Um, and so one of the things like I was talking about with, you know, if you see carbonation on the inside of the glass, um, knowing some of the off flavors that exist in beer, like if you taste um, buttered popcorn or you taste wet cardboard or smell wet cardboard or green apple, um, a lot of these things that we know in general life are considered to be flaws uh, when it comes to beer. You don't want to taste buttered popcorn in your stout, 
You don't want to taste it in your lager. You don't want to taste skunk in your Dutch lager as well. But we all know that with Heineken, and we kind of give that a pass, right? You know, so like my dad was drinking it, and but but that happens because light comes in, and the blue UV ray negatively interacts with the alpha acids uh, inside of hops and turns hops to taste like skunk. And it's something that we all know. And but skunk in marijuana sometimes like is kind of desirable. So like it's 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 these picking and choosing things. But when brewers are putting stuff out and you taste these things at a local brewery, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're making great beer. And that's a larger problem as well. So with 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 so much choice comes so much great because also you can now taste beers that are made with everything and that um, you know uh, brewers are fearless and they're doing some really cool stuff. But there, there's a lot of good with a lot of bad. Yep. So next topic, science. Um, you know, this is uh, something that people don't normally think of with beer. Um, is that but- Matt Farber? From the University of the Sciences. That, that is from the that's from the UC webpage for uh, for their brew, for their brewing program. Okay, <laughs> so that's UC Davis. Yeah, that looks like a guy who's also a, a, a brewing professor in Philadelphia. Okay, so they all look the same apparently. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe only when holding a glass. Professor Soriel, white guy in glasses. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So how how is science used to make better beer? You talk about you know people open a brewery and they make bad beer. What uh, what goes on? They're not embracing science. That's the thing. Like science and technology are at our fingertips right now. I mean, like we now can know more than at any other point in 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 our history. And you know, science and technology have brought us closer as people. It's it, I mean, it's you know, it hasn't been great in, in, in a lot of ways uh, in a lot of ways, but like it 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 has made things that we previously didn't understand. Um, in the forefront, right? No longer magic. Right, it's no longer the goddess of Ninkasi. But I also don't think that we should lose that as well. I think like we should understand it and appreciate that there are things that happen in nature and that there is nature and that there are these things that will always be a little bit outside of our grasp of understanding. And that's really cool to sort of reach for it. And like we don't always have to you know, break it all down, but you know, you can run beer through all manners of equipment these days, and they'll tell you exactly what's wrong with it. And like, that's cool. We didn't have that 15 years ago, 30 years ago. You know, our grandparents didn't have it. Um, and so, I, I think it's pushing us forward ever more. And I love the the role that it's playing in that aspect of the beer industry. Nice. You talked earlier about um, all the different kinds of ingredients that are going into beer these days. Yep. Um, we're in uh, we're in the fall season now, where there's uh, you know pumpkin spice lattes uh-huh. and pumpkin breads and everything yeah. else. All, you know you can't you can't yeah. see a dead cow. Yeah, you're setting me up pumpkin. here. Uh huh. Um, you had a kind of interesting story about kind of the origin of uh, these pumpkin these pumpkin flavored beverages. Yeah, and <laughs> now I can't remember it. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so everybody thinks of PSL when it comes to Starbucks and everything, and and, and good on them. Beer did it first. Um, it's the old South Park episode. Simpsons did it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, boy, I just dated myself there, didn't I? <laughs> um, that was like even less of the crowd knowing about 45 RPM. Um, yeah, so beer was doing pumpkin flavored beers uh, early on. I don't care for them. Uh, I'm of the camp that they should all just be rounded up, uh, put in a giant pile, and set on fire. <laughs> um, but I also know that there's people who love it, and it goes back to the saison thing before. Like it's, I don't like that that combination of spices in real life, uh, not necessarily in beer life. I, I don't like it. I don't like pumpkin pie, uh, but people do. Um, but the cool thing is, is that beer is a blank canvas. And so uh, there's a brewery in Wisconsin that I wrote about a couple of weeks ago for Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, uh, where I work, uh, that did a candy corn beer. Uh, and they, they sort of mimicked candy corn. And then I just saw in the news this morning uh, that now they're doing a white stout that evokes the idea of eggnog. And there are beers that taste like s'mores, and there are beers that taste like bear claws or... Bavarian donuts, uh, Boston cream donuts, I should say, or jelly donuts or, or whatever. Beer is a blank canvas in a lot of ways uh, to, to add flavors to things. And, and that, I think, is kind of cool because uh, I don't begrudge people who like whatever it is that, that's in that glass up on the, on the screen right there. But um, I, I don't, I don't want to drink it. So I think it's time for beer number three. Yeah. What are we going to have here? Excellent question. All right, so now we're getting into 
the next, so we went from a pale ale and now we're going into an IPA. This is a brewery that I haven't been to yet, but I know is really popular uh, when it comes to this general area. And in fact, my Uber driver on the way over here asked if I had been to El Segundo yet. Uh, Se Segundo? El Segundo. Segundo. I'm going to butcher it. Um, <laughs> and I said, no, I haven't been yet. And he's like, oh, they did a Steve Austin beer. Yeah. And I was like, that's cool. Like, did you go to the brewery because of, like, Steve Austin? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, like, that's why I went. And I was like, that's really cool. Um, you know, so it, it's it's a cool local brewery that's doing some really cool stuff. Whoop. Yeah, they're good good folks over there. You should definitely Autobots. go uh, go check yeah. it out. They're of course they're mainly known for IPAs. They do many many varieties of IPAs, lots of different hop varieties. So it's fun. You can really taste the individual types of hops in the, in their beers. But even the clarity off of this, and like I can taste a little bit more of the sugar. So this is obviously a thicker beer. If you do mouthfeel. To hold it on your tongue for three seconds again, uh, you're definitely going to come across where it's going to coat your tongue a little bit. It's going to be a little bit more viscous. It's going to be a little bit more um, uh, tongue coating. Um, this is really fun. It's got that sweetness to it. It's got a little bit of pine. Um, it's dank in some ways to, to, to use that, that uh, uh, current phrase, as it were. Um, herbaceous. <laughs> herbaceous, yeah. It, uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind to everybody, uh, as as it were. If this actually goes up online, my wife will watch this, and she'll be like, you tried to make a marijuana reference. That was really cute. Uh, you don't know <laughs> shit. Um, and neither does she, but she knows more than I do. Um, she's going to pick, oh, you tried. That was really cute. Um, yeah, this is just a fun beer. It's an easy drinking beer. This is probably higher in ABV, right? Yeah, I'm guessing about seven. Uh, it is. It's straight up seven percent. Um, this, at some point, uh, will go in the museum of beer technology of a 22 ounce bottle. Uh, everybody's doing cans these days. Everybody is switching to cans. The 22 ounce bomber bottle that you either could drink by yourself uh, if you were having a tough day or that you could share with your friends if you were feeling generous. Uh, this is a packaging style that like, like probably will not exist uh, in widespread use in another year and a half. Um, so this is kind of fun. This is, we're ahead of the curve. We're uh, watching the dinosaur watch the What's that? Why the can movement? Oh, why the can movement? Um, a couple of different, I'll jump over there in a second. But the, the question was why the can movement? Most breweries are switching to cans these days. Um, one, oh, I love this. Uh, one, the uh, it keeps out all light, so you're not going to get that Heineken problem, especially with so many hoppy beers being made these days. Uh, when you put a beer in brown glass, uh, it doesn't let light through as much as green glass. So this is why most craft brewers use brown glass. Clear glass is absolutely the worst because it lets the most amount of light through so your beer will skunk really fast. Green, it'll skunk less fast but still, and brown, it'll take just a, a little bit longer. Cans let no light through. Uh, that's first and foremost. It's also lighter packaging. Um, they're easier to transport. Uh, they're easier to pack. They're easier to stack. Uh, for outdoor lifestyles, which craft beer has really sort of embraced of hiking and biking and fishing and everything, it's easier to carry around cans in, and it's also easier, much easier to carry them out uh, recycling-wise. So there's a, there's a lot of benefits to it. So speaking of uh, glass for bottles, you, uh, you make quite a strong point in the book about not liking what we kind of think of as the traditional, you know, draft beer glass. Hate it. Why, why is that? It does no favors to the beer. It does zero favor, uh, favors to the beer. So there's, um, you know, white wine glasses and red wine glasses, and there's science behind, you know, why they work. Um, wine figured out marketing early on in the U.S. post-prohibition, and they got themselves in the white linen tablecloth restaurants, and they said, if you're going to go out and spend $50 on a bottle, it might as well be wine. And we didn't have beer that was worth $50, like when all of this was happening. Now now we do. Now we have beers that are worth, you know, $300 or, far, you know, four or $500, um, as it were. There's wine prices in beer now. Um, so we had this utilitarian one-size-fits-all glass that if you didn't want beer but you also wanted soda or seltzer or apple juice on the rocks or like whatever, you know, this was the easily stackable beer glass 
utilitarian all-purpose glass, as it were. Um, I'm trying to think of like a technology thing, but like <laughs> it's uh, I, I can't. Um, you know, but I think that when you have even a glass like this that has a wider lip at the top of it, you know, you can get your nose in if you do want to smell it that way. Uh, you know, you're not going to dribble down. There, there, there's ergonomics that go into glassware, and the pint glass just is not where it should be. Yeah, a lot of uh, well-known European beers, they have a traditional glass associated yes. with that. And if you yes. go to a a, a bar there, you'll typically, you'll get that glass for that beer. Sure. So uh, Duval or uh, Orval or some of these have their own branded glassware. Those aren't necessarily built for um, making the beer taste better as much as it is marketing. The Orval glass looks like the Orval glass and you should only drink Orval in it. Um, and I think that that's correct because that's the way that they want you to do it. Um, and there's people who will disagree and say, well, you can drink it at anything. And yeah, of course you can, you can drink it in a jelly jar if you want to. But I think it adds to an overall experience. I don't think that the pint glass adds to the overall beer drinking experience. If you're out at a bar and somebody serves it to you, cool. Um, but if you're at home, invest in a really nice beer glass or two uh, in the same way that you might a wine glass. Um, and it'll make it better. Is there a question over there? Um, do you know the beer glass that the Sam Adams Brewery Tour gives out? And yeah. And really make a huge point of like talking it up and all its different features. Is that actually a good beer glass? It is. Okay. I have yeah, several they, at home. That's why I'm Yeah, asking. they call it the, the perfect pint. Sam Adams spent... I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars uh, researching that. Uh, it has nucleation points on the bottom of the glass, so all of the carbonation is concentrated and then rises to the top and sort of keeps this nice head of foam going. Uh, it's got a wide lip on there as well, so you can get your lip around it and your nose in without spe like they spent They spent some, some fun time on it. The problem is it's really great for home. It's impractical even at Applebee's, you know, because the other breweries don't want their beer being served out of a Sam Adams glass because that's marketing for them. Uh, the glass doesn't necessarily stack well, maybe two or three before it becomes like a Jenga game that's unwieldy. Where the shaker pint, like you can walk into places and it's, you know, 20, 30 deep against the wall, um, you know, as it were. So I, this is the cockroach of, of beer glasses. It's not going to go away. Um, but that doesn't mean that at home you can't have great beer glasses. There's a guy in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, the pretentious beer glass company, uh, he calls himself. And it's all tongue in cheek. But he, he has an MFA in glass blowing. And he makes beer glasses. And it's what I use at home uh, when I'm feeling extra fancy. Um, and I love it. But for the most part, I just drink out of a tulip glass at home uh, just because I like the stem. I like the aroma. Uh, I like, you know, how it feels in my hand. Um, and it's kind of fun. Nice. Yeah. You, um, you talked about bottles already, but I wanted to read a quote from a friend of yours, Nate Schweber, you have in the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a poetry about beer bottles. As sleek as airplane wings and smooth as polished stone, these laborers of the beer industry sweat like construction workers sing like wind chimes when clinked, and sigh like happy men when relieved of pressure. Can you say anything more? We talked about color no, and No, no, I can't. Uh, and that's why I quoted Nate in the book saying that. So Nate Schweber, uh, who works for the New York Times, who's uh, one of my closest friends, uh, who wrote a great book on fly fishing about Yellowstone. If anybody likes to fly fish, uh, uh, go pick up Nate's book. Uh, shameless plug for that. But um, no, it, it, it's poetic. And beer is poetic. Like, there's so many things where I think if we just show up at the bar at the end of the day and we say, beer, and we, you know, we do this type of thing. But I think if we stop to think about the artistry that goes into it, or even just the ergonomics of a bottle, or the ergonomics of a glass, or how a glass feels in our hand this way versus another one, um, there's a lot of romance in drinking. There's a lot of romance in beer, uh, a lot of romance in the ingredients and the passion that goes in behind it. And um, I, I love that quote from Nate. I think, I think it's some of the most beautiful writing that's been done on beer. Uh, ever um, and I've, I've I've read a lot on it and I was uh, I, I was the editor at All About Beer magazine when we published those words uh, and as soon as I read it I was like damn it I'm putting this on the cover it's brilliant um, so yeah I think we have to think about it that way very nice yeah so anybody want to uh, have another beer okay what are we drinking here brother Thelonious so uh, this is from North Coast 
Uh, Where are they? They are in Northern California. They're north from here. Look at that beautiful color. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. Um, I love this beer. Uh, so this is an Abbey Ale from North Coast that part of the proceeds I actually don't know what, where they're at these days, but part of the proceeds went towards the Thelonious Monk Jazz Institute for scholarships and things like that. Um, I, I, I don't know what it is on the bottle, but this is at least 12, 13, 14%. 9.4, all right, yeah. well, I was way off. Um, this is one of those beers that when I saw it on the distributor list, I got really excited because I don't get this a lot where I live anymore. And, um, it's just such a really nice, fun, uh, indulgent beer in a way. Uh, the last time that I saw this on tap at my local, uh, back in Jersey City, New Jersey, um, I had like a pint of it because I was like, oh, it'd be irresponsible if I didn't. And then it was irresponsible that I had two more uh, afterwards. And I think I called out of work Cheers. the next day. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, the small pour goes a long way, but this is... You get that sort of roasted brown sugar, candy sugar thing going on with it. Uh, it's got some dark stone fruit, like a little bit of plum and fig coming through as well. We started off with the Allagash Saison, which is an American interpretation of what a Saison should be, but that tries to stay as true to the style. Uh, and ending on this beer uh, is very much the same way, that in between the two IPAs are very much these beers that have defined the American tradition uh, and the American beer market. But right now, the, the two beers that sort of bookended this, like show us the old world of where we came from. And I think that that's really important. You know, as, as all things progress, like we can't forget our history. Like we can't forget like where things came from. Um, you know, and in technology, right? It's like, I, I think about like my first like, you know, like Nokia phone. Uh, you know, back in the day, uh, like the 5150, um, you know, I, and, and I appreciate now that I have a Samsung 9 or whatever in my pocket, but like it's... Android. Uh, is, yeah, yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, ver yes, very much so, uh, uh, Android here. I'm going to stop at the help desk if that's cool on the way out. Um, <laughs> no, but like, but like to remember where we came from, I think it's really important to appreciate like where we are today. So I had a question I was going to ask you about um, about how how do about how do you know, all this is these a mean sign <laughs> about you know how do all the breweries stand out in this you know in this cacophony of breweries today? But we're almost out of time. Yeah. So if we can, I'm going to go ahead and skip this one. All right. And I'd like you to end on talking about um, something a, a topic that's been in the news a lot today, even here at Google, um, sexism in beer. Um, one of our one of our beers today from Three Weavers is a is a female owned brewery. It's three women who own that. Yep. Um, maybe talk just a bit about the kind of the history of uh, sexism in beer and and where the industry is today. It's getting better. It's getting better. Um, for a long time, it was a male dominated industry, uh, both in the people who worked at the brewery and who owned the brewery. Um, but beer itself, as a as a beverage, doesn't know gender. Uh, you know, it doesn't know sex, it doesn't know religion, it doesn't know creed, it doesn't know, you know, your political beliefs, uh, you know, as it were. Um, it's a great leveler in a lot of ways. Um, but when the beer that was being made for a long time of the beer flavored beer, the American industrial light lager, um, yeah, there's women who drank it, but it wasn't being marketed to them. In fact, it was almost being marketed against them, where you'd see Budweiser commercials with, you know, women in bikinis, uh, you know, being objectified, and then the guy is, like, clinking their glasses, very, yeah, you know, and these days, you walk into a tap room, you know, like at Three Weavers, and... You know, it's 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 diverse. Like it's it's people are coming for the good beer, and they can come from the tech sector, or they can drive an Uber, or they can be a reporter, or they can be whatever. Um, and they're all coming in for the same beer, and it's sort of this great leveler for us. And so, yeah, sexism still exists in the industry, and I get into it in the book where uh, there's some breweries that have done some really boneheaded things, uh, things, some really stupid things, um, naming their beers that uh, seemingly promote rape culture, or you you know, that are xenophobic or homophobic or, you know, anything else uh, in, in between. Um, and if you're doing that and you're a brewer, get the hell out of the industry. You know, like, just, like, stop. Like, we, we don't need it. We don't want it. Um, 
but I think that consumers are speaking up now more and more thanks to technology. And there's a lot of cool things that exist between beer and technology. But um, uh, if somebody posts something on Facebook and like, hey, we've named this beer and it's like this really idiotic name, it whips around the world so fast with, ba with like smart people being like, knock this off. Like, this is wrong. And you can almost set an egg timer to when the apology is going to happen. And I think that that's great. Like that's, you know, because it keeps people in check and it sort of, you know, hopefully drives that culture underground enough so that it eventually just disappears because we don't need it in our world. So I have, I have some more questions, but we're really out of time. Okay. Check out uh, John's podcast there. He discusses this and other interesting topics in the beer world. So, uh, so check it out. John, thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much. This is a real, a real, real pleasure. pleasure.